I think that should be sufficient time. Hopefully those that come in late uh, can catch the recording. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Brendan Curran. I'm an associate at the Green Finance Institute. Uh, I'll be, I guess, comparing today's webinar, the first in the uh, investment readiness series of webinars, um, as we are also as part of the EKN conference as well. So uh, thank you very much for all joining today. As a little bit of an agenda, we'll start off with an introduction from Dan Barwick from DEFRA as the session before moving to my colleague, uh, Helen Avery, who will be giving you a run through uh, the investment readiness journey. Um, before handing over to Andy Slaney from the Environment Agency, who will give a little bit more detail on the fund itself um, before having quite a significant Q&A section before closing with Bruce Hard from the EKN conference, who will add a little bit more uh, colour around some of the other sessions that are coming up in a few weeks' time. So I guess without further ado, I'll hand over to um, Dan from DEFRA to introduce himself. Thank you, Brendan, and hello, everyone. As Brendan said, my name is Dan Barwick, and I work in DEFRA's domestic green finance team. And I'm going to say a few words to very briefly introduce the Natural Environment Investment Readiness Fund, which we are currently developing. So the policy background to the IRF is the government's 25 year environment plan and green finance strategy both of which set out the need to stimulate more private sector investment into protecting and enhancing the natural environment if we're going to improve the environment within a generation. Now, in order to attract private sector investment, natural environment projects need to generate revenue. And we've seen pockets of innovation springing up where projects are managing to do this, for example, by selling the environmental benefits they produce in the form of carbon, biodiversity or water quality credits. And to support this innovation, the IRF will provide technical assistance grants on a competitive basis to organisations with project proposals that have the potential to do two things. Number one, protect and enhance the natural environment in line with the 25 year environment plan and number two, generate revenue from ecosystem services in order to attract and repay investment. So we've drawn inspiration from the social investment sector, which has developed exponentially over the last 10 or 15 years, supported by public investment readiness funding. And we're hoping the IRF grants will enable projects to build capacity and capability and procure the professional expertise and advice they need in order to become investment ready. So the exact investment readiness needs will vary from project to project, but could include support on financial modelling, revenue generation, investment structuring, capital raising, legal and governance advice, impact measurements, et cetera, et cetera. The grants will be for technical assistance support, so they won't be used for delivering a project on the ground, but will enable projects to progress to the point where they are ready to attract investment in order to proceed. So the IRF will launch next year, administered by the Environment Agency on behalf of the DEFRA group, and provide up to £10 million in technical assistance grants. We're very interested in supporting the development of project models that can be scaled and replicated so the sector as a whole can learn and benefit from the outputs of the programme. So we're very pleased to partner with the GFI and EKN in providing these sessions, which I'm sure will be very informative. So I'll hand back to Brendan to get things started. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Dan. Thanks, Brendan. Um, <laughs> and, and thanks, Dan. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be here and we're really excited to be hosting these IRF informative sessions that we hope will be um, will help you as applicants or simply as interested parties become a bit more familiar about the journey towards investment readiness and what that entails. But we just wanted to share a few words with you about who we are to start with, as some of you won't know the Green Finance Institute at all. So um, the Institute was set up in 2019. 
um, based on a key policy recommendation to the UK government. So we were seeded with government money, but we operate as an independent and commercially focused organisation. Um, and we sit at the nexus of public sector and private sector and finance sector. So our mission is to mobilise capital towards transitioning the UK to a net zero and greener economy. And we do that in several ways. The first is what we call financing green. So we take a sector in need of transitioning and create a coalition of experts and practitioners who can uh, identify the barriers to investment and then develop the solutions together. So our flagship coalition is was for the energy efficiency of buildings. Um, for example, that's identified and is developing several demonstrated projects that can help unlock capital to invest in the decarbonisation of the built environment from um, financial products like green loans to the creation of standards and metrics to guarantees and policy labour tweaks and other sectors are working on a, the de decarbonisation of heating and transport for the UK. And it won't surprise you to learn that we've been researching the possibility of what that would look like for nature. Uh, greening the financial system is also what we do. We work with regulators and policymakers and the financial sector, but relevant to this audience, for example, would perhaps be our work in the Task Force for Nature Related Financial Disclosures, the TNFD. Um, it's the TCFD equivalent for carbon. So our CEO, Rian Mary Thomas, is co-chair of the informal working group for the TNFD. And it's hoped that at the conclusion of the task force's work by the end of 2023, financial services, the private sector, perhaps even governments will be able to report or disclose their risk from dependencies on nature, as well as their impact on nature. Um, and finally, we act as a knowledge sharer hosting events and trainings. Um, we thought, however, for this first introductory session, where it's really is a chance for you to ask questions about the IRF and applications uh, and the application process to, to the EA and DEFRA, we would just perhaps offer some scene setting around the potential for investment uh, in nature projects and nature-based solutions and provide a sense of the journey towards becoming investment ready and outline also the upcoming sessions. So hopefully it will provide some baselining to the whole cohort here um, so that we sort of understand what's expected. So the good news is after decades of nature restoration and conservation projects having finance limited to donations and grants, we're really seeing the tide turn and interest from the private sector and the traditional finance sector now. So um, there's a growing awareness of the value of nature. We've basically treated that value as zero, as you all know. And now we're understanding that um, the, the ecosystem services that nature provides and the role in maintaining sustainable and resilient economies and the importance of that. So you're probably aware of the IPBS report last year. That was a real pivotal moment. Um, there are also lots of reports looking at nature's monetary value, including the Dasgupta review currently underway and led by the UK government. Um, also to sort of help this fact, data is improving in helping with the understanding of this value. Um, as a con as consensus on the importance of decarbonizing our planet has grown, there's also greater understanding that nature-based solutions for carbon capture are probably the best and cheapest technology we have right now as well as being technology, not just for mitigation, but adaptation. So blue-green infrastructure, for example, for flood um, management resilience, um, cooling, perhaps less relevant to us in the UK. Um, the transition of land use, also chiefly our agricultural land, is, is seen as the equivalent of the transition of the energy sector for the decade ahead. And then finally, you know, investors really want nature to be part of their portfolios now. So in August this year, you may have seen HSBC and Pollination Fund announced they were um, launching a joint venture and hope to raise uh, initially a £1 billion fund to invest in natural capital. Um, and then I just had this quote here from the UN Principles for Responsible Investment on the left that that says that nature-based solutions focused just on reforestation and afforestation could generate $800 billion in annual revenues by 2050. So lots of good news um, around investing in nature. The challenges, however, um, are that money isn't finding a home right now just because there aren't enough investable projects that satisfy investor demand for scale and returns. 
Um, pension funds, for example, are looking to put at least £150 million to work. And smaller investors exist, um, but they too need a return. So at present, we have fragmented small scale pilots, some of which are not investable yet, or maybe too small, not replicable to be interesting to an investor. Um, and this process to develop a pipeline takes time. You know, it took decades for renewables to be a scalable proposition that mainstream investors look to. And along that journey, you know, we needed public financing and R&D funds and grants. We needed demonstrated projects, um, examples of scale and replication, and a lot of socializing with the investment community. And nature-based projects are gonna be no different, but this is really the decade for nature. And Andy's gonna talk more um, after me about the key aims of the Investment Readiness Fund in that journey. So just moving to the next slide, uh, we've put together here like the pipeline from cradle to grave. Um, so from the idea, uh, the very beginning, perhaps written down on a napkin, <laughs> um, to ending up being invested in by large scale investors, hopefully with very large regional national impacts for nature. And we thought it would be good to walk you through this journey so you can see where you are on it, um, how close to investment readiness you might be and what you might need to consider as you sort of move towards that, um, that part of the journey. Um, and, you know, we sort of see investment readiness as being number three here on this journey. It's not the final leg, so it's good to keep that in mind um, that there will be this sort of stage of scaling up afterwards. So phase one that many, if not all of you will know well, is the technical proving stage. Um, there's a need to develop a wetland, a preserve, a forest, to transition farmland to sustainable practices. And you're assessing current baselines and potential, maybe starting to assess what sort of products or credits or benefits that project or business might produce. Very early days. Here, typically, the funding comes from grants and donations. Um, some of the examples here will be familiar to you, hydrological mapping, carbon sequestration, um, measurement, uh, beginning to sort of engage with stakeholders, flood assessments, maybe identifying a market for your product. Um, and then comes phase two. Um, and to note that these phases are going to overlap a little and technical proving is probably going to be in every phase. Um, so phase two, we actually call the monetization phase. And in this phase, just starting to figure out, or at the end, you may be at the end of figuring out what your project can sell. So it's benefits or it's products and who is prepared to buy or pay for them. So the benefits of your project are like the product. So for an enterprise, it might be timber or seaweed or a night in an eco hotel being sold, but that product or benefit could also be carbon credits, clean water, the ability to mitigate flood and therefore lower costs for insurance companies or a local council, it could be healthier soil, improved yields for farmers. And in this phase of monetization, you're identifying what those benefits are, whether they are measurable and who a willing customer may be, what they might pay. So um, corporates like airlines might pay for carbon offsets, water utilities will pay for clean water, Food companies like Danone or Nestle might pay for healthier soil or organic produce. Um, building developers may pay for biodiversity credits through biodiversity net gain. Local councils, um, councils sorry, may pay for flood management projects. And you may even be able to tap into sort of lodging taxes or fees if you're developing a major tourist or recreation attraction. Um, and these benefits can be stacked to create multiple revenues. Um, and also a beneficiary may have several benefits they're prepared to pay for at once. So you can start pooling them together to build um, more money coming in. <laughs> so um, on slide, the next slide, there are, um, uh, there's a, a few examples here where benefits are being stacked to create an investable model. Um, and the one I wanted to highlight is the top one, it's, um, it's the Louisiana coastline. Um, part of the Mississippi River Delta uh, is, is, is Louisiana and it's losing about 16 and a half square miles of coastal land and wetlands a year. Um, and there is a 50 billion 50 year plan for restoration, but even with funds from the state and funds from the Deep Horizon oil spill, um, there's this big gap 
in how to restore those wetlands. And that cost per acre of restoration is gonna double every 20 years. So it's huge. Uh, it's gonna wreak havoc on biodiversity of the coastal area and the wetlands there. And the Environment Defence Fund has been looking at how to turn this into an investable project, therefore. And one proposal they've had is to stack different types of funding and revenue streams. So for example, the deep, oil, the deep horizon oil spill fines I mentioned with public sector funding, but also, and here in this image is Port Fourchon. Um, Port Fourchon sits in the wetlands and on the coast edge. It's a um, bit of an eyesore, as you can see. I went all the way down there last year, <laughs> so can vouch for that. Um, but the infrastructure of the Mississippi Delta supplies 90% of the US's outer continental oil and gas. And this port serves all of the tankers and offshore oil and gas industry there as does the nearby town serve the people who work on those rigs. So it's a bit of an unusual match, thinking about restoring the environment and using oil and gas money. But the Environmental Defence Fund have approached the oil and gas industry to see if they will pay for the restoration of the wetlands. And they're also working with the town to develop wetland tourism, to pay for some other parts and rethink fishing licenses, kayaking licenses. But that they're gonna be sort of small fry, to be honest, to get to the 50 plus billion um, dollars they need. Um, it's worth saying this has not got off the ground, but I think it's a really great example of thinking outside of the box about who could be your beneficiaries. And they may be unusual bedfellows. Um, so also right now, the oil and gas community don't have to report on their dependencies on those wetlands. No businesses do. Uh, they're not reporting on the risk to their businesses but they're probably going to have to within the next five years. You remember I mentioned the TNFD um, a couple of slides back. When that comes in, companies are gonna start after reporting, which means they will all want to be factoring in how they're going to pay to mitigate any risks they have from nature. And some of that restoration is going to be nature-based solutions. So um, I choose this example um, to sort of just sort of give you some food for thought really thinking about multiple stackable benefits thinking about unusual beneficiaries and thinking about sort of looking out um, over the next few years about who's going to be wanting to pay to mitigate any nature-based uh, risk they may have and how could you might maybe start interacting with them now so it's obviously really large scale but um just worth thinking about um and you know, this phase two can be a long stage with more technical proving, a lot of stakeholder engagement. Um, now you're starting to get into contracts, legal fees. Um, and then moving on to the next slide, we have perhaps get to uh, the hardest part, taking those revenue streams and turning them into a model that works for investors, because you're gonna need to fund and then repay the upfront costs of your projects, um, you know, to buy and plant and then manage a forest or to convert the soil, uh, to construct wetland, to build rewilding centre. And this phase three is really where the Investment Readiness Fund wants to get you to. So on the next slide, you'll see um, uh, a model. Um, this is actually Port Fouchon and what's been discussed in an environmental impact bond. And we'll talk through some of the investable models in a moment. So you can see here in this pretty crude diagram that um, what's been proposed is there will be an issuer uh, who issues a bond that funds the construction of the wetlands that then provides the services to the myriad of beneficiaries who pay for those services, as well as combined payments from the Deep Horizon Spill um, Oil Spill Fund. And that in turn allows for a coupon to be paid back to the bond investors in addition to the repayment of the upfront capital as well as the management of the project. So there's a lot of um, assessment that needs to go in at how to uh, generate that much revenue that can, that can achieve that. So this is an example of, a, a, of an environmental impact bond, but it would be similar if you had a bank loan, you know, you'd be having to pay an interest uh, rate back um, uh, and if it were a fund, it would be a return or a dividend. And the costs at this stage, you know, can be large. They're, they're legal fees, um, uh, governance fees, um, setting up structures, um, uh, advisory fees. So um, just to offer some of the investment models, and we're going to pick up on these throughout the next session so you can see for yourself some of the examples and hear from the project developers. 
Um, the first is, you know, very simply a bank loan, RSPB and Trees for Life are going to share about how they got to that place. The second is a, a fund model, and we'll hear from SLM Silver Fund and the Iowa uh, Soil and Water Fund. Um, bond issuance that I mentioned, the environmental impact bond, they're actually in the US at the moment, but there is one being developed up in the north of England, and we're going to be hearing from that project developer in session four. Um, and the fourth model that really has bang for its buck that you're probably all familiar with um, in England is it allows small projects to, to take part in the creation of markets is you know, nitrate credits, phosphorus credits, um, obviously carbon credits. And um, we have some examples of these and we'll be hearing more about them. So here we are back on our journey to investment. And this, then we sort of reached stage four where we're really trying to reach transformational scale, maybe sort of aggregating um, some projects together. Uh, and uh, that comes with its, with its own <laughs> challenges, but just worth bearing in mind. So for some of you, this might be quite a lot to, to take in, but just a reminder, we're gonna have a lot more time to go through examples and for discussions with investors and project developers You'll be able to put your questions to them. We'll also make sure you have summaries of all the sessions and recordings where there are recordings. Uh, we will be available uh, as well by email and, and Brenda will share those at the end. Um, so just on this, the next session we have, the next three sessions will take place during the EKN conference and Bruce will share a little bit about that. Um, session two, we'll be hearing from project managers who've successfully acquired bank loans or investor monies for their nature-based projects, several international examples among them. Session three will be a panel with four investors, all very different in scale, all looking at nature, environmental finance, Lloyds Bank, Pollination and Triodos. The fourth session will be with those projects in the UK right now that are in stage two or stage three of this journey, so we can hear about what has worked what hasn't, to hear about innovative models like the environmental impact bond, to hear about stackable benefits, and to hear about how to price carbon credits from Woodman Trust. Um, it's really worth mentioning here, there are tons of great sessions during the EKN conference beyond these. So I um, encourage you to attend as many of them as you can, <laughs> um, because they will surely provide a lot of helpful insights and ideas. And finally, in December, um, after you've had some time to digest all this information, you might have further questions for the EA, DEFRA, your peers, us, intermediaries, consultants. So we're going to be hosting, um, depending on demand, one or two sessions that are breakout rooms. So small groups designed for you to ask and have answered any remaining questions you may have. You can also reach out to me or Brendan at any time over this process um, uh, or, or the EA on the email that we provided at the end. So with that, I'm sure you're really eager just to hear the details of the IRF and how to apply. So I'll pass back over to you, Brendan. Thanks. Thanks, Helen. And I'm sure off the back of that, there are a lot of questions so specific to what Helen um, presented. So I would ask just to draw your attention to the Q&A function at the, the bottom and we'll try to get, we have quite a sizable um, time set aside to answer those questions. So do put them in there and we'll come to them after I pass over to Andy. Um, so Andy, I'm just going to bring you forward if you can unmute yourself and uh, take it away. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Brendan. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, so my name's Andy Slaney. I work for the Environment Agency. Um, I focus on innovative funding and green finance. Um, today, I'm pleased to provide you with an overview of the Investment Readiness Fund that we're currently developing in partnership with and on behalf of DEFRA Group. Um, so yeah, could you move on to the next slide, please? So as uh, Dan said at the start, um, both the government's 25 year environment plan and green finance strategy um, set high expectations for the role um, green finance and private sector investment can play in financing on our, our environmental goals and both the actions and transition needed to address the climate and nature emergencies. As Helen highlighted earlier, traditionally we've looked to government for funding, but increasingly we're seeing an appetite for investors to finance these actions and have been asked by government to look at how we can bring new sources of funding to supplement those the government can provide. And this in essence is, is what we're looking to encourage with the Investment Readiness Fund. Moving across that investment journey from monetizing natural capital services um, through towards the investment stage, developing and testing new approaches to funding, which balance risk and return for investors and owners of natural capital. So the government announced in its March 2020 budget 
that it will commit up to 10 million pounds to stimulate private investment and market-based mechanisms to improve and safeguard our environment. We're now designing this investment readiness fund to deliver on that promise. So the primary or overall aim of this fund is to improve the financial resilience of the natural environment sector and increase the overall level of funding available by stimulating private sector investment. We'll do this by developing, testing and demonstration of commercial natural environment business models which generate a sustainable financial return and contribute to the goals of the 25 year environment plan. Fundamental to achieving this is identifying how to monetize those benefits of natural capital um, and environmental projects and in doing so to develop a pipeline of investable propositions. So collectively, we need to create that opportunity. We need to create opportunities for public, private and third sector investors to invest their capital in ways that generates um, a financial return and positive environmental impact. Uh, we need to create opportunity for businesses to increase their resilience and discharge their regulatory or environmental uh, voluntary environmental obligations in cost effective ways uh, through natural environment solutions and also opportunities for farmers and landowners to diversify and generate income through increasing the flow of ecosystem services their their assets provide so can we move on to the next slide please so what is the investment readiness fund well as as um Dan said at the start, um, the IRF um, at its core is a grants program uh, provided on a competitive basis. Uh, grants will be provided to enable project developers to create investment ready proposals. And we envisage funding will help, um, help you build your internal cap capability and be used to address barriers to green finance and investment. Uh, investment. We expect grants to be used to supplement your own resources and used to procure support from professional advisors to aid the development of proposals to present compelling investment cases. In doing so, we want to support the development of a pipeline of investable proposals that test models which protect and enhance the natural environment and generate revenue from ecosystem services to attract and repay investment. Proposals for RFF will need to be able to share their learning so we expect projects to be replicable by others. And if proposals are small scale, need to, uh, need to be clearly scalable. And obviously through the, through the nature of the funding um, and the fact that this is uh, a DEFRA initiative, the geographical scope of the IRF is England. Um, however, where benefits accrue cross border with Wales or Scotland, for example, um, funding may become available proportionally to the environmental benefits to England. So can we move on to the next slide? So um, we're adopting a principle of flexibility. Uh, as such, uh, we aim to minimize those that can't apply for the funding. Um, we need to ensure that applicants can demonstrate the activity is additional to normal operational activities. So we can protect public money, but we don't wish to exclude good project ideas. Um, so el eligibility um, is quite broad. Uh, so not-for-profit organizations, um, public sector bodies, uh, but also private companies where it can be clearly demonstrated that it's some um, additional and good value for public money. Um, inel ineligibility um, for applicants is, is limited only to central government departments or non-departmental pu public bodies such as ourselves. However, uh, we can work in partnership with you if needed. In addition to grants, uh, we want to use this fund to build uh, learning as a sector throughout the life of the programme and beyond. To do this, we aim to provide additional support through convening communities of project developers, investors and intermediaries to advise um, or to ensure efforts are aligned to support your needs as, as key stakeholders. Um, we also aim to actively make project products and learning from the projects developed through the IRF openly available to others. So for example, small scale pro proposals uh, need to be replicable and scalable. So what's developed in one project can support others across the sector. And this support will evolve obviously over the life of the program, but we're starting now through these webinars um, delivered in partnership with the uh, Green Finance Institute and Ecosystem Knowledge Network. So can we move to the next slide? Um, a key condition obviously of these projects uh, to be eligible for funding is that they will protect or enhance the natural environment. Um, 
and by natural environment we, we are we do mean uh, one or more of the natural capital types on screen so it's this isn't about technical um, or uh, it, it's, it's about natural environment rather than um, technology um, I won't read out the list uh, but I hope these categories are are familiar to you and um, would be applicable to the projects you'd be considering so we can move to the next slide so as I said earlier, the intention of the fund is not to be overly prescriptive. Um, the IRF funding is intended to supplement project developers' own funds and primarily be focused on additional support required to progress natural environment projects from traditional models of delivery. So the left-hand end of, of Helen's model earlier um, uh, towards the right-hand end to move you towards that right-hand end towards attracting finance. The funding isn't, as I say, about spades in the ground. Uh, there are other funds available for that sort of thing. It's about developing compelling investment, compelling investment cases, uh, moving along that journey from monetizing natural capital benefits to becoming investment ready. As such, examples of activities we consider as eligible for funding could include uh, some internal um, capacity support, but principally be for consultancy advice. Um, really around um, how to design and structure a project so that it will generate revenue and or cost savings. So things that we would anticipate uh, supporting that would be activities such as commercial appraisal of revenue generation proposals, commercial and legal appraisal of potential investment and repayment terms, legal and governance advice, particularly uh, covering input, uh, putting in place legal or other necessary structures to manage income generation, external investment and repayment agreements, uh, business and financial modelling, investment structuring and capital raising, um, any support around those areas, uh, developing marketing and sales promotion strategies, um, impact measurement and management, um, but of course uh, the ongoing management of the project. So can we move to the next slide please? Um, in order for us to assess applicants, um, applications, sorry, uh, we need projects to demonstrate the extent to which they will deliver on a number of key criteria. Uh, we, I think we will be publishing these, but um, they're currently in draft. Um, so we're asking applicants to demonstrate, quantified where possible, uh, the environmental outcomes of proposed project models. Um, so how will your project um, achieve 25 year environment plan goals? Um, the financial potential of the proposed project model so how the project would generate revenue from ecosystem services, how can cost savings generate a return for an investor, uh, what level of private sector investment will the project attract or has the potential to attract. Uh, we also need to have confidence you can deliver the project, so you need to be able to evidence uh, clear project costs um, so that we can see a, a good value for money in delivery, um, assurance that all permissions, consents and agreements will be are being considered, how benefits will be monitored and evaluated, how levels of investment and revenue generation will be measured, and a, a description of um, engagement already undertaken and an indication of the support your project gets from key stakeholders, but also really importantly, um, from beneficiaries who ultimately pay for the services being offered. And of course, as mentioned earlier, um, we're really keen. Uh, we need to understand the potential for innovation and learning. Um, how that can be transferred um, and how projects can be scaled or replicated. So if we can move on to the next, thank you. Um, as I've said, we're currently designing this programme uh, and this webinar is part of our engagement activities. So subject to the results of our con consultation, um, we're proposing that the IRF would be launched early next year. Uh, we'd have a six week application window for both uh, expressions of interest and applications. Um, assessment would uh, or project assessment would, would happen early next financial year with the first tranche of awards being granted <clears throat> probably in the early summer next year we're proposing the value of grants would be in the value in the range of between 10 and a hundred thousand um, uh, with all 100 percent of project costs being available uh, but clearly match funding um, would also would demonstrate commitment and would be considered favorably uh, we, we anticipate projects would typically have a duration of, of less than a year, um, but we, we wouldn't anticipate uh, that being in excess of two years. Uh, so if we can go on to the final slide. Um, so as I say, this is currently, uh, we're, we're consulting on the design of the scheme. 
So throughout November and, and into early December, we're looking to engage with people who have an interest in the work through an online survey and also through some virtual workshops. So if you're interested in becoming involved, um, please contact us at the uh, email address on the screen. Um, and that was it from me. So I think that's uh, thank you. And I think I'll hand you back to Brendan. Thanks, Andy. Um, and again, I can see there are already a lot of questions coming in. Um, so we will be moving to a Q&A section before briefly trying to do some polls. So if you're like me and stayed up last night watching CNN, you're probably a bit bored of polls at the minute, but do bear with us as we're going to do a few right now just to gauge where people are in some of those investment journeys that um, both Helen and Andy mentioned. So um, Bruce, could you possibly pop up the first poll and we'll see if we can give everyone a minute just to feed in. So I'll give everyone just a, a 30 seconds to a minute if you could just answer the question to your best knowledge. We're almost there, I think, in terms of people filling in. I'll give it another 15 seconds for any any stragglers to feed in. Looks like we're rounding around the average of three, which I don't know if that's always an indication of um, people just taking the easy option. But hopefully throughout the webinar sessions, we can see a progression up towards greater understanding towards five. So we'll, we'll do these questions again at the end. So I think we'll close that now, Bruce. Um, if you want to pop up the results, if possible, as well. Yes. So you can see it's mostly around the middle mark, but um, hopefully, as I say, we'll see a progression with a slightly more weighting towards five as we get to the end of this series. Um, and Bruce, if you could put up the second poll, please, that would be fantastic. Sure. Thank you. We'll give everyone just another 30 seconds to feed into this one as well. Brendan, I think there are a few who, um, perhaps because they're joining via the web, can't uh, see the poll. So just wonder if you could just uh, the, uh, read out the, uh, the question that's showing just so they know. Absolutely. So the first question is, on the following scale, how well do you understand the process for taking a project through to securing private investment? So with one at the low end, no understanding up to five being full understanding. And I think um, the last poll, as I said, was more around the three in the middle. But in this poll, we have no one saying a full understanding. I don't know if that's humility, but we're much more towards the lower end with less understanding. So we'll give it another 15 seconds, Bruce, before we publish those results. Also, as has been mentioned before, there'll be a full recording uh, of this published on the GFI YouTube website. Uh, and also hopefully we can share the results for that if you want to review back, but we'll also um, be able to share those at the end. Now, Bruce, if you can close that poll and share up the results, that would be great. Okay. So mostly 45% in and around that too. So towards the lower end. So as I've said, we'll hopefully do these questions again in um, uh, webinars four or three and four. And hopefully we'll see an upward trend as these webinars help people's confidence and knowledge of this process. So we have one final poll before we move into the Q&A, as I know there's plenty of questions coming in. This is more around where people who have projects feel that if they do have projects that might be uh, in line to apply for the IRF, what, what stage do they think um, it is on that investment journey that Helen laid out so clearly uh, in her slides? So we'll give everyone... Um, half a minute there just to feed into that as well. So the options are just to repeat for those that can't see, just to remind them as well as lower end technical proving the first stage, second stage is monetization, investment readiness, um, and then the sort of more transformational scaling up. And then there is also an option for not applicable for those who are unsure at this stage or potentially don't have a project. We'll give it just another 15 seconds, Bruce, and then we'll come back into the room with the panel from GFI, um, DEFRA, 
and the EA and try and answer as many questions as we can within the time. Okay, Bruce, so do we, should we just uh, put up those results so we can see, or for those who can't see, 46%, um, so the majority, which was the technical proving, so uh, maybe it speaks volumes in terms of where people are on this journey, that there are 23% um, monetization um, and 7% at investment readiness. And possibly unsurprisingly, uh, no one put at that scaling, transformational scale uh, option. So Bruce, if I... We close the poll and we come back in to Zoom. We can now hopefully take some of the questions that have been put up. Bear with me. So, first of all, um, Dan Barwick has not been able to join, but Meg Megan Patel from DEFRA is here. So, Megan, perhaps you could introduce yourself just while we get the first questions right. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Meg Patel. I work alongside Dan in DEFRA's Green Finance um, program, um, supporting the delivery um, of the Investment Readiness Fund. Thanks, Megan. Um, and so, should we move to our first question then, if possible? So, um, I think, Andy, you covered this, but Dr. Marion Bruce from the Highway Boundary Limited slash Kirkland Bank Farm. Uh, is the IRF just for England and Wales or across the UK? I think you covered that in your session, but if you just want to reiterate at that point, that would be great. Yeah, just to, just to reiterate, the, the funding um, is, is through the tre Treasury and through DEFRA, so it's for England. Um, however, if projects have beneficiaries outside of England, uh, then we'd be considering uh, funding based on a proportion of the benefits that go to England. So, for example, if, if it was cross-border with Scotland, 50% of the project uh, physical benefits were in Scotland, then 50% of the funding would be, could be made available. Excellent. Thanks, Sandy. Um, and another question more specifically on investment types. Um, would uh, any investment funds be government-backed? So this is... For example, uh, AIMS or EIS in, um, that could give investors other benefits besides dividends, so tax relief, um, uh, potentially like the social investment tax relief that you get on more social investments. Is there any consideration for that role? Perhaps maybe Megan or Andy have an answer on that. I think that is something that we're going to take away and think a little bit more about. So as mentioned, we are working quite closely with um, the social investment guy, um, colleagues on this point. So I think that's something we can give more information on as we're de developing the scheme and developing our scheme guidance. I think just, just to add for that, um, I can't comment on, on tax policy. Um, but I think the the learning that we gain from all of these projects can be aggregated upwards, and any cases can be can be made through through government channels for um, changes should they be beneficial to the UK. Thanks, Andy. Um, so I'll move on to the next question as best we can. So the Gwen Parker from has asked. Uh, could you touch on the ethical issues around suitable beneficiaries? I don't know. This is, you know, bigger payer, bigger polluter dilemmas. Maybe uh, Helen or Andy, I know you touched on your example of Port Fouchon uh, and touched upon this point. Maybe you have some views on this. Uh, yeah, sure. And it's probably um, for for Andy uh, and Defra to talk about what their concerns are about the beneficiaries um, for these for this particular fund. Um, as it, it, I deliberately gave one of Portugal on it because it's such an awkward one, as you say. You know, like why would we pay polluters? Why would we take money from polluters? You know, to help us out. Um, so it's a bit of an exaggerated one. But maybe another example could be, um, for example, um, Bristol has a lot of issues around flooding, um, and there are a lot. It was in a McKinsey report recently about how there are a lot of 
um, warehouses that um, I think they mentioned 600,000 vehicles are being stored in warehouses around Bristol right now that would be susceptible to flooding. So um, you could think about approaching sort of those companies um, uh, to st start paying. And the reason I mentioned this is because all companies are going to be transitioning. For Louise, down in Louisiana, the oil and gas companies cannot transition to wind because actually the Louisiana coastline won't support that. If they could, it would be great, wouldn't it? They'd be converting to wind as well as be paying for wetland. In the case of sort of the vehicles, maybe they'll be tr um, uh, transitioning to electric vehicles or um, you know, hydrogen fuel cells or whatever it is we end up with, and they can end up paying. So you can marry that. So that's all I can offer really in terms of as you think about um, um, working with beneficiaries and maybe sort of encourage them in their own transition and understanding where they are in their own transition so you don't run into some of those problems of you know they're adding more issues to to uh, to the pile but it's probably for um, uh, uh, Andy to sort of comment on whether they're thinking about those things for the IRF. Yeah I think um, there are a number of different mechanisms and regulatory frameworks to address non-compliance or um, compliance within different sectors. Um, some of them, you know, can involve formal channels, others less formal channels. I don't think the, the IRF uh, is, is really intended for uh, meeting compliance. Um, so from an ethical perspective, this isn't about um, subsidizing businesses to achieve compliance with regulatory duties. It's more pushing them down or encouraging them down routes such as uh, TCFD or TN, I can't remember the acronym, but the, 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 the non-climate, the nature version, um, and basically to, to include more ethical practices within business, but not around compliance with regulation. Um, that those, those are through other effective channels that, that are, are widely available. I don't know if you want to add at all to that, Megan. Yeah, I will say that um, this will be um, a general grant scheme um, and in line with the government standards for grant agreements. Um, and there is um, a set of um, conditions as part of that that calls for a code of conduct um, that has to be kind of adhered um, to by grant recipients. And there is a section in there about the kind of the ethics. Um, the kind of um, the links with other partners and beneficiaries and that there has to be kind of due regard to um, the potential for um, any kind of um, calling into doubt of um, our kind of um, I, th I think the wording is around um, um, the potential for bringing our funding in disrepute in di in dis disrepute so I think there's some kind of quite high level um, conditions there that will be um, ensuring are um, included in our grant agreements and but I think the detail of the those relationships will probably be interrogating in more detail as we um, develop our scheme guidance and to think about the specific conditions that we attach in our grant agreements. Excellent thanks very much Megan and um... On the, on the acronyms point, we did have a question what TNFD stands for, and that's the Task Force for, Na uh, Task Force for Nature Related Financial Disclosures. I almost forgot it myself, which um, get me in trouble. But we have a, a couple of questions related to farming in particular, so I'll, I'll couple those together and see if we can answer them. The first one from Joe Kennedy from the Lancash, uh, Lancashire Wildlife Trust. Would, first of all, farmland be eligible, Andy? And then another one from Joe Finlow uh, from Fens for Future Partnership. So if there were farmers or farmer groups, would, um, will, if they will be eligible to apply for, will they be eligible to apply for funding and propose farm-based activities that require research advice and additional, and additional or additional to existing activity be eligible? So I guess those are one and the same question, but it's more around the eligibility of farmland. Um, farmland, like every other type of land is eligible. Um, it depends what, what you're proposing to do. Um, this fund, uh, as, as one of the um, conditions of the fund, is essentially that uh, it needs to be a natural environment benefit. So if, if, um, if you're looking at, say, converting farmland for, um, I, I don't know, carbon, so you were farming, farming carbon, maybe that, that could be an opportunity that was, that was potential. I mean, a, a collaboration of farmers uh, would be 
also eligible as long as there was a an entity in which a contract could be uh, agreed with um the the intention of this this project uh, or the irf is very much around developing models that are scalable um you know one individual farmer doesn't own a whole landscape um, and if we're looking at, at aggregating these things up to to landscape scale, we need to have uh, networks of farmers working and farmland is obviously a, a critical element um, in, in management of, of catchments. I think Thanks, Andy. that covers it. No, 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 I think that yeah. covers it very well. So I'm just trying to manage the different questions coming in. So. And there are a lot. So I'm just to re reiterate, if we don't have time to answer all the questions, we will answer them via email afterwards. So please bear with us as we try to work through them. So one question on regulation from Lawrence in the West Country Rivers Trust is around, can um, some on the panel comment on how we ensure measures are additional to any regulatory requirements, um, stating that also sometimes the latter are not often enforced? Um, go on, Meg, were you going to come in there? Um, I was going to just comment um, just really briefly that we will be working with kind of other regulatory teams and other policy areas on this matter. So I think that the point is a fair one. Um, and there is some detail on the relationship of how, you know, we engage with other teams. Um, and that's certainly our intention to do that to ensure that all the bids that we get in have that kind of assessment built in. Um, so we're able to judge that. So um, I think that's something that we are thinking about quite deeply. And I think I think just to add to that, um, we, we've got um, four trial projects currently running. And hitting that regulatory baseline as a minimum before you can then um, go above that is, is quite quite a difficult one. Um, there are some water quality projects where understanding compliance against that baseline is, it's, we're learning the best way of actually addressing that at the moment before we can then go above that baseline and then rewarding, essentially rewarding good behavior. Um, so it, it is it is a currently live topic and it is a very difficult one to to unravel there isn't a simple answer i think each individual project would have to be um, considered on merit great um so staying on this sort of regulation theme i guess um we have a question from sam evans in the um, gmca or the greater manchester combined authority um more broadly, how do you see the end ambition for the IRF alongside continuing grant funding in areas where investment could be brought in? So he gives the example of expected funding for peatland restoration next year. Um, and I know from other schemes we've had, we're always wary of grant funding that could displace potential investment as it's, as it's launched within central government. Is there any thoughts on that, Andy, at this stage? Um. There are various different government funds or grant funds. Um, I think there's no illusion that uh, there's a silver bullet here that we're suddenly going to be able to to get all environmental projects funded by the private sector. So this this fund is about exploring how where that investment um, stacks up from investors' positions, um, and I think that there's always going to be a role for blending different levels of finance and taking different levels of risk. Um, and it's it's a it's a me the mechanisms around blending the finance so that the government may be able to to reduce the risk of private sector investment may be where this this ends up going, but this is very much the early stages of that journey, um, demonstrating the monetization and and getting investment on board. You know we, we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. We've got a long way to go. So, um, but I think in in the longer term, uh, there, there's likely to be a role for for the government to to take that that de-risking step in a, in a wider investment proposal. Great. Um, we have another sort of question around the, the fund scope of the IRF. Um, this one comes from Zoe Hancock um, as part of the Brist Bristol Avon Catchment Partnership. Quite simply, it's can match funding include sources of DEFRA funding from other grants? She gives the example of the uh, DEFRA Green Recovery Fund. I understand, strictly speaking, that's not permitted, um, definitely under the um, standard grant um, conditions um, that 
the cabinet office likes to have apply across government. So I think the answer to that is is no. Um, and, but I think the um, the thing that we are doing is working really closely with those other funds to ensure that 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 actually the projects that we fund are appropriate for that funding stream. Um, so we're working quite closely with the challenge fund policy leads to ensure that they're able to fund projects and we're able to um, fund projects that are um, um, supporting and have those links, but there, there's no crossover or any overlaps. Great, um, I'm sticking with the sort of fund scope questions, uh, Matt York. Uh, from the Wildfall and Wetlands Trust asks, um, how does this fit with the planning system? So um, section 106 requirements, SBA cons uh, compensation, biodiversity net gain requirements to compensate for mitigate the environmental damage are not confused with CSR requirements or commercial credits. Um, is there any thought been given to how you overcome that challenge? Um. I think if you're talking particularly, say, uh, developer uh, or planning permission or conditions upon um, development, then this fund wouldn't be wouldn't be relevant because they're they're sort of legal obligations on, um, for example, a developer to to mitigate for for damage to the environment. However, um, one of the aspects that could come out of this is uh, the implementation of biodiversity net gain policy. And there are various conversations around things like habitat banking and how do we pre-invest in improving, you know, use use finance and investment to bridge the time lag um, that could be caused by developers buying compensatory um, packages. And, and there may be an, an element for those sort of activities to, to be supported by the fund. But when we look at quite straightforward um, planning obligations, that certainly wouldn't be um, applicable. Okay. Um, just covering one sort of administrative question I can see has been voted up. Uh, this, we can share the slides and as to re reiterate again that the recording will be available on the Green Finance Institute YouTube channel, which we will send a link up to our, our to everyone who attended the session, hopefully having that uploaded by Monday, Tuesday next week. So you can all um, uh, review all the questions and slides again. Um, we have a question from uh, Sarah Johnson and the Lancashire Peatlands Initiative. Um, would the IRF fund land purchase? Um, so this could be the purchase land that could be restored or financed through the PES, for example. Do you want to go, Meg? Yeah, I, I, I think the answer to that is no, because um, what we're, we're what, hoping to achieve from these projects that we're actually building capacity and knowledge and know-how um, to so the output is actually a project proposal so I think any um, purchase of assets or capital is not permitted from this grant scheme. Right so as a similar question I guess from Darren O'Connor from the Soil Associations of, uh, about the use of grant and um, can the grant be used to carry out research to demonstrate environmental outcomes if these do not yet have reliable measures, for example, soil, soil health for farmland? I, I, to me, that would feel, it, it kind of depends on, on the kind of proposal. Um, that sounds more like a research grant to me. This is very much um, you're looking at understanding what those natural capital services and benefits are, how we monetize those, and then turning those into an investable proposition. Um, so if if we're still at the stage of not quite sure about what that benefit is, then we'd probably need to have some confidence that that was going to go through a relatively fast journey to be monetizable um, and investable. So that that may or may not be. It depends on on the the scale of the the, the proposal. Sure. Um, so another question here, and I'm keeping an eye on time. I think we have ten minutes. There's still time to get, answer quite a few more questions. Uh, Sean Ashworth from the Sussex Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authority asks, are advisors available to help applicants through the process, um, for example, case officers? Uh, we have quite a limited resource of, of staff supporting the fund. Um, we would endeavour to support people through an application process, but we, 
we can't um, guarantee that at this point in time. Sure. Um, so I have uh, a question for Helen, just to give uh, Andy and Meg a, a bit of a break for a second. Um, do you have um, examples of the degree of confidence for investment returns required to make a, a project attractive for investors? So maybe we can speak to the future mm -hmm. sessions on this. Yeah, so the next sessions, the, the very next one um, on the 24th of November is specifically cases that will share um, what they needed to do to get investors, um, whether it's bank loans, whether it was a fund. <clears throat> um, so hopefully that will help um, sort of show that journey. And, you know, they have been invested in, there aren't many out there in the world, <laughs> to be honest, but but there, there are some, and we have found that these four, um, so uh, that are relevant to, to the market for, for England. Um, and then in the third session, as I, as I mentioned before, we, these, we're gonna have a panel of investors who are gonna talk about exactly the kind of returns they want, and it's gonna vary. Um, so I am hoping in those two sessions, if you attend them or are able to, and they'll probably be recorded, so you'll have recordings as well, that uh, some of that will be cleared up and you'll see that there is a confidence that returns can be, can be made. Great. Thanks, Helen. Um, and yeah, we'll share again details of those other sessions upcoming. We've got quite fantastic panelists who are going to be giving their insights from the investor view, but also those uh, going through the project progression themselves. So we have a question here from the Parks Alliance and um, what, and maybe one for DEFRA, as I know you've been doing a lot of research into this, is what have you learned from the social investment sector? There have been many investment readiness funds in this sector over the last few years, but on the whole, the picture remains one of plenty of capital available, but still too many investable projects, still too few investable projects at the right scale, um, scale and type. So what, what were the lessons you think from the social investment sector that we can bring into this model? I think that's quite a challenging one to summarise um, in the time that we've got left. And I think that we recognise that it's an ongoing kind of overlap of learning there. So we we do have um, colleagues from um, the social investment sector sitting on our programme board, for example. Um, so they're with us every set, step, step of the way. So I think that we're learning from them um, actually on a quite uh, a step by step basis. I don't know if Andy, if you've got any top um, kind of lessons that we've learned from them that you can summarize yeah I, th I think some of the some of the early lessons are particularly around um designing this fund in reflection to the the uh, maturity of the market um, we're very keen to make sure that um this this fund is targeted much more at project developers so i know other models within the the um the social sector have, have targeted uh, supporting the investors or supporting intermediaries. Um, there are pros and cons for each different approach. Um, and I think the decision we've taken now is, is to focus on the very much on, on the kind of uh, grassroots, the kind of uh, the project developer aspects of it to, to make sure that we can develop from the, from the ground upwards at this point in time. Um, I think with the social sector, they've had to move around the different aspects of the market to, to stimulate different, different areas. And I, I no doubt um, expect the same will have to happen here. Um, but it is, you know, like Helen just said, there are very few examples where this is working at the moment. And we need to get those examples or, or we're just, you know, we're starting from the starting point. Um, you know, we need to we need, everybody needs to work really hard and you know the government's prepared to take a risk with this fund to actually stimulate this market and i think we need to to really capitalize on that and you know take it for what it is and, and really use it to to get this market moving and hopefully we can follow the markets like the social sector or, or the uh, the carb decarbonizing energy and those kind of things and and you know massively increase investment in the environment that's a hope Excellent. Uh, and I think we have time for one more question. Um, I think I'll take the one from Willis Towers Watson, uh, which is as a private sector initiative, um, is the focus mostly on beneficiary pays models? Uh, if so, is there any complementary work on the regulatory side to embed uh, a polluter pays principle, which could provide additional financing? 
a nice tricky one to fin finish on, I think. Thank you. Um, I think there's very much a beneficiary pays focus to this. Um, the polluter pays focus is probably more for the regulatory framework. Um, that's not to say that we can't learn and uh, stimulate across the piece. I think uh, DEFRA have got quite a wide remit in, in looking at how we, um, how we regulate the environment, how we make improvements to the way, uh, the way regulation works, the way stimulation works. Um, so I think there's, there's kind of a, a, a spectrum here. Um, we can tap into it along the line across the along the line and like the tax question right at the start um, the more evidence that can be developed um, for any particular argument then the more consideration can be given to it to be investigated more fully by government okay. thanks very much Andy and again Helen as well um, I think we'll close the question answer section there but thank you very much for all your questions for those that weren't answered we will be taking them away and trying to come back to you via email or maybe share them more widely as maybe some people have similar questions. Um, with that in mind, I'd like to hand over to Bruce. So I'll see if I can seamlessly share my screen once more without any feelings and pass over to Bruce to give a little bit more insight into the uh, EKN, the rest of the EKN conference. Thanks, Bruce. Great. Well, thank you very much. One of the reasons why DEFRA initiated the Ecosystems Knowledge Network back in 2011 was to uh, start conversations between those who would regard themselves as uh, stewards of uh, the natural environment and uh, other uh, types of professional as well who work to, uh, to other objectives, whether it's in uh, the health sector, uh, for example. Um, so that's why we got the Natural Capital Investment Conference uh, going a couple of years ago, uh, where there were, there were many in the network uh, representing the sort of project pipeline, um, uh, people developing environmental restoration or environmental protection projects. And we were really keen that there was a conversation between them uh, seeking innovative finance and people in financial services who are really interested in becoming involved in uh, environmental restoration uh, projects because of uh, the climate adaptation, climate mitigation, nature recovery, uh, and of course, all, all of the economic benefits. So this is now the third uh, natural capital uh, investment conference. Uh, we're delighted that uh, many of you in this webinar uh, have chosen to be part of it. I'm sure you will have all come across the, uh, the pages uh, about the conference as you booked on this particular session. So please do uh, block out the time 24th to the 26th of November. Uh, this conference comes around uh, roughly once a year. So it's a fantastic opportunity to continue uh, this conversation. Uh, we're looking right across the UK, uh, not the conference as a whole, isn't uh, just focused on England. Uh, it's looking right across the UK and learning from examples uh, from uh, other uh, parts of the world as well. Uh, so do uh, join in, block out the time. Uh, there's actually an additional session I'm really pleased to, you're the first to hear about, uh, a session which is all about investing in uh, seaweed harvesting and processing. Um, so uh, there will be a pitch session uh, that we will be announcing very shortly uh, to include in the programme. Of course, there is a session on dedicated to investing in the marine environment. Uh, look out also for a session specifically about the role of local government in catalyzing finance for the natural environment. So we hope there's plenty for everybody and all of those uh, in this event. Um, but one thing you can do uh, to support the conference is share it. Uh, we're really pleased to be offering it uh, as to free for delegates, so uh, why not share it with your networks? We've got plenty of capacity uh, in the online system, so uh, don't keep this to yourself. And of course, your colleagues will discover those uh, second, third and fourth uh, investment readiness fund webinars as well as part of the mix. We're really grateful to those who uh, have stepped forward to uh, sponsor this uh, conference to Finance Earth, formerly known as Environmental Finance, to WWF, 
Wessex Water Entrade Systemic and uh, we're really glad to have the support of the Green Finance Institute as well. So thanks to all of those who are making this event possible, um, but please uh, do join in the conversation and spread the word uh, about this event. Uh, you'll see the social uh, media uh, links on the slide right now. So uh, looking forward to it. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. Um, so I think that just gives us time to close up and you'll see there's a little bit more information further what Bruce said. Um, if you have any questions that you weren't able to ask during the session, um, do email us uh, either the Environment Agency or if you have questions about Helen's slides or more of the work of the Green Finance Institute, please do get in touch. And as I've said before, we are um, going to be sharing the full recording after a bit of editing, of course, uh, on the, our YouTube website. So that's easy enough to find. If you go onto YouTube and type in the Green Finance Institute, you will find us and other great uh, videos from ourselves. Um, but I guess at that point, I think I'd just like to thank all those who contributed and thank you all for joining. Um, hopefully we'll see you at our next webinar as listed here on the 24th of November. Until then, thanks very much and um, have a very nice afternoon.